Hello, Rufus King Nation. This is Anthony Lauer, art and design teacher at Rufus King High School, and you're listening to Season 2, Episode 9 of The King's Cast, a podcast introducing our listeners to the men and women working each day to teach the next generation of Rufus King Generals. Today, we're talking about choir and music production with Lee Stovall, one of Rufus King High School's recent additions. In our conversation, we will also discuss how the International Baccalaureate Program aims to develop King students into inquiring, knowledgeable, and caring individuals who strive to create a better and more peaceful world. Thanks for taking a few minutes to listen today. Hello, Lee. How are you today? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I am well. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Lee Stovall, one of the newest and technologically savvy uh, additions to Rufus King's Fine Arts Department. Uh, He teaches choir music production and runs up the RK Records Club after school, helping students to learn music production and technology. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start off today and ask, what was your route to becoming a teacher? Yeah, for me being a teacher, it almost seems partially predestined, pre pre detest pre determined determined, predestined yeah predestined uh yeah so both of my parents are teachers my mom was a third grade teacher for 34 years my dad taught child psychology at uw river falls Uh, my older sister is a teacher and so teaching is definitely something that's in my family and also my extended family and i just remember like loving grading papers when i was like in sixth grade in my mom's classes and helping her out around the classroom and so it's definitely it was always an option and then i remember my freshman year of high school my choir director 25 years retired and there's this big um, celebration of the work that he did and i saw that an impact a teacher can have on a community and that was kind of really what started to sell it for me so from there i went to school at uw madison and then i've taught anywhere so far in small schools big schools urban suburban rural kindergarten college so i feel like i've kind of taught a little bit of everybody everywhere yeah that that that's a lot. It, it's a lot of varied things. And I know one of the things that you and I have connected with uh, is having come from outside of an urban school district to kind of see the perspective of how education is working everywhere. You obviously have way more uh, experience in that trifecta of rural, suburban, and urban than I do having only been in a suburban and an urban school district. But that was one of the ways that we connected. And one of the ways when we, either one of us has questions about why do we think MPS is doing it that way? Oh, well, maybe there's this other way. And you've taken some of that experience uh, into some of the leadership roles you have around the school, um, which I know I appreciate uh, having you in those positions to help the rest of us have those new perspectives. Thank you. Yeah, I enjoy, like, I feel like teaching is so similar in different places and ideas can transfer and cross and we just need to be open-minded and ready and open to new perspectives. Yeah, being able to receive some of that uh, different perspective or that new process or an old process that might be working somewhere or need to be updated. Yeah. Um, What is one aspect of the IB that you connect with? So one thing I like about the IB, and it was funny when I kind of transferred over into here, uh, the four standards or the four criteria in IB, uh, MIP IB, are actually very similar to the same um, strands that we developed at my previous district. Like we completely made this curriculum from scratch and we had these four criteria and almost all of them exactly aligned to the MIP IB criteria. So we have first having the knowledge, then using that knowledge to apply to skills, and then going taking those skills into a performance and then reflecting on that performance. So I really like that four step process. And it was actually funny because it was something that me and a few other teachers had developed from scratch and got to almost the same exact place kind of on our own. So it means that it's something meaningful that if different people completely independently can find their way to the same conclusions. Yeah, and I think now this is my 18th year of teaching and having seen pedagogy change on a national and, and, and statewide level, I think everybody's starting to come around with that. And I know that I probably sounded like a cheerleader for IB, but like 
this is where IB started, right? This is where uh, like-minded individuals from multiple countries and nations came together to come up with these standards, which of course have changed in IB's history, but have changed only in name and in scope. It was still that idea that there's a beginning, middle, and end to most all content. And now I've seen the National Core Standards do that. I know that the NAEA has done that for visual arts. It's really kind of pared down what used to be strands or umbrella standards or key concepts, all these different names to this four or five step process where you start off gaining new knowledge you then start to practice with that knowledge, you produce with that knowledge, and then you reflect on how that went. And I agree, having sharing the same standards with you, that that also helps with the visual arts uh, as well as the musical arts. Mm -hmm. In your classes, do you have a favorite unit, topic, or project that you teach? I know, witnessing you across the hall for the last three years, I've seen some really cool things you've done, but what is your favorite? Uh but sometimes my favorite is when I get to put on a different teacher hat. So for music technology and production, we do a whole unit on like sound waves and physics, and it's really fun to break out kind of some different things. So like we're throwing ping pong balls around the room. We have slinkies that act as compression waves, and it's just kind of fun being able to like step into sub other subject areas. Um, going into music theory sometimes, it's like you're teaching math and that type of thing. And then going over song lyrics and kind of dissecting poetry and talking about meaning and applying that to the music and making that feel deeper. So I kind of, I enjoy the fact that I don't necessarily have to stay in one box, but I can kind of pretend like I'm a science or an English or a history teacher for talking about the background of a song. I can kind of put on different hats and explore different things and I don't feel like I have to be one kind of teacher. You know, I think that's one of the coolest things that I've gained. Uh, granted, the pandemic kind of stifled some of your early performances, but one of the things that I have noticed about your concerts is that they're coming in with a theme, but that theme is being embedded with history and context and meaning. And that is the red thread that goes through your concert, which then I would imagine goes through your class throughout the semester. And it brings together your, your intro um, or your beginner's choir, your intermediate and your advanced choirs. And they're all kind of singing different songs and dissecting different um, genres, but getting that connected thread to the history and the meaning behind it that I think, I, not having been in music class myself, but I don't know if I've ever known can be such a big and powerful way to learning in music education. Yeah, that's for me how I approach one of the biggest challenges in music education today is there's still this stigma that um, European classical music is the center. And for a lot of students still, if they want to move on and go to a music school, they have to go through an application process where they have to sing European classical music. And so, um, they're, and it's still embedded a lot in our state and national standards, being able to perform that style of music and to receive any legitimacy and outside thing, like there's a sense that you have to at least have some of that experience and background. So trying to get students to connect to that and build the bridge to that this is kind of the way I try to tackle that problem. So trying to find a universal theme that um, Italian composers in the 15th century were thinking about, and also modern composers and songwriters in today's popular music world are thinking about, and our students are thinking about. And so trying to connect those and building that gap so students can find ways to relate to that music, and ultimately find ways to enjoy performing and singing that music. So can I ask then, how did you tackle that project, that problem as a performer yourself, because I know that outside of teaching high schoolers, you also perform professionally. I know that you've been part of an acapella group. I know that you are a professional singer when you're not in this building. So how did you, coming from um, a small town in Wisconsin, approach this idea that you have to learn some of these classical um, terminology and technique just to kind of get out there in the world and put yourself out there? And then how did you overcome your interest or adversity to that stigma of European music? Um, I've always just been a general music dork. Like I will enjoy any kind of music in any context in any ways. Like I try to break it down. I try to figure out like the goals or the style and what the style is trying to do. And I remember just growing up, like I didn't really listen to 
the radio of the time, like growing up in the 90s, I actually listened to mostly like Motown in like 50s, 60s. And so I never really had like, this is my culture music. I just kind of like, I would listen to that at home and then I would play, my first instrument was playing piano. So I'd play like a lot of like European classical music on piano. And then I would play, I played cello in the orchestra. So that had more kind of like Baroque and classical period music and then sang in choir, which kind of had a little bit of everything. Uh, so I've never really like, had like a cultural like this is my music i kind of just loved music as a general like art form and yeah so i enjoy currently like i do all of the teaching within my classroom but it's also i sing in an early music group that does mostly medieval and renaissance music called a peri Anamam in town uh, so that's been a fun thing for me to kind of look into and dissect a piece of music or a style of music that I haven't really looked at seriously until college. So I've been in that group for a couple of years and that's been really enjoyable for me to kind of um, push myself and try to uh, reacclimate to a different style of music that is very challenging but also very rewarding. You know, and that reminds me that one of the other things that you've done out in the community is that you've taught at the college level. And if I'm not mistaken, you're also running a choir group through that college. Is that correct? Yes. I actually, I just, this is my first year. I didn't do it this year, but I previously taught at Alverno College. I ran an acapella group called Nova Acapella, uh, founded that group, and they performed and competed for five years. And that was really fun kind of to work with students at the college level. Uh, and having that sense of more collaborative approach with them. Uh, yeah, so I really enjoyed that. And it's, again, that's a completely different genre of music that was contemporary a cappella, so modern music arranged for voices. Yeah, so hearing how you've overcame that idea that there was maybe one route to get into music to uh, perform and or uh, succeed uh, in the succeed in the industry as it is um i can see now that that's also how your music shows your uh, choral concerts are organized right you, you kind of jump all over the place not in a random way but you are introducing these kids to some music from many different genres so you overcame that challenge just by being a music dork but you now bring that back into the classroom i think we had miss aeon and <clears throat> one of the quotes that she mentioned was that one of her former teachers said, be the teacher your student self would have wanted. Yeah. And that's where she guides her classes. It sounds like being the music geek and liking all these different experiences and seeing their commonalities is what got you into music and down this path. And now that's what you're bringing to the classroom to help Rufus King students. Yeah, and the day, on day one, I tell students, give yourself the chance to like something new. Be open to liking something new. I'm not saying you have to like it, but give yourself a chance and you might be surprised at what it is. And I think for me, that's always what I try to do. And another big thing I really try to do is I need to believe in the music I'm teaching. If it's like a classical song, just to be a classical song, and I'm just kind of like, I don't really like this, the students know. And so I really have to like choose music that I can find ways to connect to and relate to so that I'm excited to teach it and that hopefully can give students a chance to get excited to learn about it. Um, next up, what advice do you have about attending school at Rufus King? I would say the advice I have for attending school at Rufus King is to try as many things as you can. This is a great high school for those that really want to put themselves out there and uh, there's a club for everything, there's an activity for everything, and you can't, you, this is one of those places that you don't have to be in just one thing. All of the advisors really want our students to be well-rounded and want the students to have multiple experiences and opportunities, and so it's really great to be in a place where it's collaborative so I can work with the debate team or I can work with the basketball team, and I've had students that um, have sung for the national anthem and then suited up and played for the game. And so that's been uh, kind of fun to have like a collaborative thing on the staff end, but also it's for the best of the students. And so my advice would be to do as many things as you can, put yourself out there, be involved. Uh, that really helps you connect to the school building. It really helps you build relationships with other students and the staff. And I think my only, the only thing that can happen in a large high school that, that really will get you off track is if you kind of just are in your own little bubble and you're in a little, little corner and don't really reach out or branch out or push yourself, 
then I feel like that that's the students that I kind of worry about is that they're often kind of isolated and they're not involved and that's they don't have a connection to the building or to their academics after that. So to follow up on that, if your advice is to go out to clubs and activities, I'd like to bring up that you do advise and work with a couple, the newest being uh, our RK Records. Do you yes. want to talk a little bit about getting that up and off on the getting that off the ground um, and established here at Rufus King, and where do you see that club going? Yeah, it's brand new. I mean, we've had maybe like four or five meetings, but I have um, a excited group of students uh, that are excited about this new club. So RK Records is essentially a music production and business kind of club. Uh, the goal for it is to operate like a record label within Rufus King High School. So students will be collaborating on producing music. So I'm gonna have songwriters, performers, producers. Um, so we're gonna be creating music and eventually being able to license and distribute it online to streaming services like Apple Music, Spotify, pretty much any mainstream service. And when we get to that point and we convince the powers that be to help us start paying for those subscriptions, because that's also where podcasts can live, yeah. um, on a paid service, of course, we'd have to pay just to be on there. Uh, we'll team up for that. Yeah. Um, I do want to add in there, sorry to cut you off, but the intro music of the school song was mixed last year, two years ago, by one of your music production students as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that catchy little beat coming in. Yes, yeah, so that's one of my favorite projects is uh, basically students are given this file that's editable. Uh, it's called a MIDI file. and. They import it and they have to do like a remix of our fight song. This year I also added the alma mater as well for my level two students. And so yeah, it's fun for to seeing the students' creativity and that's one of the first projects that they do in the year. Maybe I'll mix in one of those tracks um, to this podcast just so people can hear it, at least the alma mater, because yeah, that's a 90 year old song that could certainly use a bit of an update. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna move into a content specific question um, as we've been talking about being in the fine arts together. You teach our uh, tiered choral program here at Rufus King with all the classes performing twice a year for the public. In IB, the MYP art standard D is entitled Evaluating, defined as students being able to construct meaning and transfer learning into new settings to create an artistic response that intends to reflect or impact on the world around them, as well as to critique the artwork and performances of oneself and others. That's, that's a, I know that that is a loaded statement, uh, but could you share with how you incorporate this standard into your winter and spring choral concerts? Yeah, I think that's a big thing is getting, the first thing for me is always getting students comfortable enough performing in front of each other. That's always been an issue, but actually that was the one thing coming to King that I was the most surprised about is here more than anywhere else I've taught, students are afraid to sing in front of each other. And so I'm trying to kind of build that confidence, having students sing first in front of each other in larger groups and then trying to bring that down to smaller groups and then trios and then pairs and eventually kind of singing solo. Uh, but that's always been a challenge, actually, is trying to get the comfortability to be your full selves and sing your full selves and being that vulnerable in front of other people. And so kind of once they have the confidence to be in that smaller group or sing by yourself, doing the whole thing in a choir concert with 30, 60 other people becomes much easier. And I think for me, the other big thing component of this standard B is reflection. And so I really try to, after the concert, we'll listen to it, we'll try to break down what are some of the things that we learned, what are some things we were successful at, what are some things we want to improve for the next time. And that's a lot of how like the artistic process works for professionals as well. Um, for my professional choir, we'll listen to a concert or listen to a recording of us performing something. And it really kind of, you can kind of hear easily internally like oh what can I do better but then also in the whole group like what can we do better and I think that's what I try to incorporate in um, our standard D for our concerts after we're done with that. Does this connect with the group you brought in this week for students as well? Yeah so this is actually yes no Two Tuesday ago. I brought in um, actually a person I knew from college who is now a voice 
professor at Bethel University, um, Dr. Marin Gill and her colleague, and they actually performed um, African American art songs and spirituals, and they kind of talked about the background of that. Uh, so yeah, that was very fun to kind of ha see an old friend and see somebody who's very accomplished. And the research that they did um, is not actually done very often. One of my favorite things that she said is that she got to correct Harvard. Um, <laughs> so the Harvard Glee Club for many years claimed that they were the uh, first college or the first U.S. college to perform overseas. But it was actually the Fisk University Jubilee Singers, an HBCU, that was invited by the Queen like 30 years before Harvard and they performed there and the queen was in love with them. So uh, I don't know if that's quite answering your specific question. No, it, it, was, was, it was so I guess then the kids were giving that opportunity to be exposed to not only a new performance, but mm -hmm. the history of that song. How did you then bring that back into the classroom and have them reflect on it? As uh, our theater colleagues take the students out to see performances around the city and then reflect back on others doing drama, um, how did you have the kids reflect back on seeing another performance uh, live in front of them. I think it was really good for them to see um, people perform this music in person, because I don't think many of them have ever heard uh, a classically trained soprano or baritone like live in front of them, acoustically, no microphone. Uh, so I think that was very powerful. But it was also like they gave a lot of the background and the reason why the music was sung that way. So kind of Cliff Notes version is that these Fisk Jubilee singers um, were all classically trained and they're the first people to sing these um, Negro spirituals arranged in a classical manner and so they sing pretty similar to like an opera chorus style and so even to this day because that was the standard that was set if you're singing an arranged spiritual you sing it in that uh, kind of more vibrato heavy classical style which is that something that students didn't know so i think um we're doing a couple of spirituals on this concert and so it gave us as a choir a, a window into how that performance technique should go well, and gives them that ability to compare and contrast and to hear it live uh, as well as from an expert compared to maybe just hearing a recording or reading it off the page of sheet music, um, I think probably is really giving them that food for thought to prepare for this winter's concert. Yes, and representation is huge. These are two black faculty who are who have doctorates in vocal performance and are teaching other people in vocal performance, and they look like a lot of our student population and they can possibly see themselves as that's an opportunity for them. It's not just open and set for some people that look different than them. Yeah. So at the end of each interview, as we've had a very good and long conversation, which I appreciate, uh, I ask my guests to have a closing thought, a quote or a book recommendation. Did you uh, bring any of that today? Uh, okay, so mine is Know Your Why. I forgot the specific comedian's name, but it's a YouTube video. Um, I show it at the beginning of every year. I also include it in my like last lecture of, of my seniors. And it's really kind of a great look into how to finding your purpose and knowing your purpose and how that can inform how you work with there. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so it's um, Michael... Jr. is all that's listed. Yes, comedian Michael, Michael Jr. Jr. Um, so it's a comedian um, that kind of just talks and he goes into kind of the purpose and your why and trying to find your why and the reason why that's a huge important thing in any walk of life. And so that would be my recommendation. And it's nice because it's just like a quick burst of inspiration, but it's also something that has stuck with me. And it'll probably be something that students walk away with it. And at some point, it's going to be that light bulb that goes, now I get it. Now I need to know my why. I found my niche in the world. I found my passion. I have found my why. And now I remember that clip that Mr. Stovall lectured on. Um, so that's a nice thing to offer students. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Stovall. Yeah, I look for forward me. to our concert in a couple months. And uh, have yourself a good rest of the semester. Yeah, Thursday, December 8th at 7 I didn't think about that. Yes, please plug the concert. <laughs> Let us know if you're willing to reveal the theme. I know it already. But if you want to reveal the theme and the uh, time frame, that would be awesome. Yeah, so Thursday, December 8th at 7 o'clock. A theme is a light in the darkness. Be here, performed live by the Rufus King Choral students at our very own Durr Auditorium at Rufus King High School.
Hello again, Rufus King Nation Builders. I wanted to thank you for taking the time today to listen to our Ninth Kings Cast podcast, introducing our community to the staff working daily in the halls of Rufus King High School to support our student generals. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Lee Stovall discussing music in our students' lives and in their education. After today's conversation, I am inspired to grow and build the technology in my art room and here at Rufus King High School. That said, please join us again next month as we sit down with another Rufus King staff member to discuss how they bring the International Baccalaureate to life in their classroom. King's Cast listeners, thanks for listening to the very end. For your efforts, here's a 1990s style bonus track for you, the Rufus King alma mater, remixed by one of Mr. Stovall's music production technology students. Here's to the colors, here's to our fame, blue and gold of King March on. Yeah, so I'm not much of a singer, but enjoy the remix.